can record this for a moment. It'll one of these days they'll all get up there for you to look at because they're all each year it's different, different things coming up and happening. <coughs> but today we're looking at sort of the next stage in the sort of exploration of sustainable integration of corporate governments, and I want to look at from the per from this sort of corporate level, the top level, why we're here, uh, why we're doing things in business, and so on. And I'm going to look at two different parts to it. Um, first of all, we'll go back over last week and the, so some of the stuff you've done in your research over the week of uh, the consequences of failures of governments. And then I want to look at what is the purpose of a corporation and some of the fundamentals, particularly responsibilities of directors in this government's game. Now this is a, a slide that came that we had last week really, the work you were doing, to look at examples of failures of governance, to both at corporate and at information governance levels, to think about all the stakeholders who were affected and to look at some of the um, impacts on them. And so this is kind of where you started. Although, as, as you pointed out, a lot of those sources aren't there, but the self et al, et al paper is available. I gave you, put that somewhere for you, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. So that gives you some ideas. It also talks a little bit about um, well, some of the responsibilities of directors, but I've actually got the exact quotation from uh, available for you now of the UK Companies Act 2006, section 172, item 1. Let me refresh my mind just half an hour ago. A bit more than that. How many sort of good sources did you guys manage to find over the week as you were researching for this? Uh, varied. It varied. From zero to about two, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I know you lot. <laughs> We took it away for it. Where is this insatiable curiosity that I'm trying to instill in you all? To find out for yourselves. To heal those leaky buckets which otherwise exist if I just tell you things. And this is kind of what I wanted you to do. Obviously, not an awful lot has happened. And I doubt that anybody has actually ended up with some sort of critical analysis. Anybody? Anybody? Oh dear. Oh well. You can do that as part of developing your assignment shortly. Because it's kind of important. It actually fits together. Um, if we look at this subject, the subject of the assignment, which is all about government's issues relating to use of location services in their rather erratically accurate or inaccurate form. That it's actually going to be quite interesting to find out what has happened um, if people are using inaccurate locations. Uh, it's something that, you know, this, the School of Computing and Maths here in Derby is becoming uh, known for, that we've done a lot of work so far um, characterising the accuracy of smart devices. <coughs> um, and I'll, I'll be down in London in two weeks' time, taking part in the two or three weeks' time here, um, taking part in a discussion um, about these sort of problems with te telecommunications companies. So, you know, what we're really looking for is finding the evidence of what has happened, who and what has been affected, what the impact was, and, you know, and who. So that's really trying to give you some structure about the sort of analyses you're going to do, need to do right at the very beginning as you look for sources of information, as you look for the consequences of failures um, in terms of using all of this internet-based stuff which is kind of short of veracity. We don't really know which is correct and which is not correct and for that which is not correct, how much is incorrect and it's very variable. And even if you think about the sensor network and we've got, we should have one here somewhere 
some of the labs have got a little yellow wire sticking out from a uh, Ethernet support, um, and I think it's got a little temperature gauge on it. And all of these things kind of vary, so you can't rely on these gadgets being absolutely accurate. I was talking to someone just recently, and I can't remember what on earth. Oh, it's to do with pollution measurement. Um, the little gadgets you can buy, which you can link into the internet as part of that internet of things. <coughs> and you can buy there's two or three different sorts and different qualities. Um, one, of, one sort kind of breaks after a couple of weeks and stops working. Uh, another one carries on working, but its calibration drifts with time. So it might show brilliant quality of air or something one week, and next week without the quality of the air physically changing, it's measuring something different. And then it just goes down the curve. And so you need other information to help you get, to kind of assess its quality. Is it still calibrated? And with, with, the internet, with the location service, one of the things is that you get random, massive errors. And if you're only picking up snapshots every now and then, you can't tell which is which. If you've got the sequence, you know, you're driving along and you go through a sort of dead spot and the GPS goes bonkers for a couple of points. And then it goes back, it, get, it gets back sorted out when you get proper visibility in satellites. If you've got all of the trace, you can just dismiss those two outliers, the errors. But if you've only got those two, and you don't know the times, know much more about it, you don't know whether they're accurate, inaccurate, or by how much they're inaccurate. And so you've got to start thinking about some of these questions. What and if you think about the company over at Ilkeston that provides those monitors, um, sort of cab monitors for, for lorries, fleet, uh, fleet lorries, one of the first things they had to do was, as they compared, each pair of positions they come along, every now and then they get random errors in the GPS location, which means a lorry is travelling at 100 miles an hour or 1,000 miles an hour uh, in some random direction. They have learned to filter those out quickly because GPS is randomly inaccurate. Because they could do that because they had the full sequence. They knew which roads they were supposed to be on. And you, know, you expect the difference between each point to be constant speed most of the time. And so if you suddenly get this thousand miles an hour, well that's manifestly impossible for your average 40 tonner. Um, so you just say, ah, that error, that point is wrong. You expect the next point to have some random speed and then you get back to the 56 miles an hour that you're expecting or something. So looking at the purpose of corporations moving on, because um, this gives you some interesting stuff and I'd like you to have, first of all, a look at the, the 2K reports, the interim report for 2012, and his final report, because they're kind of interesting. There's some lovely stuff in there. And he also, in there, makes some reference to uh, the responsibilities of directors. The, the K was really quite interesting. He also put out a beautiful um, parable you could call it, that's relevant to us in the world of big data and analytics and predictive analytics, about the way the world is kind of moving at the moment in looking at evidence. And it starts off with the fact that 100 years ago or thereabouts, down at some uh, farmer's market down in, I think, Cornwall or Devon or somewhere like that, they had a nice little competition, guess the weight of a steer, of a bull. And they discovered that if you, to cut many long, a very, very long story short, that if you've got several hundred farmers looking at that bull, the average of all of the estimates was pretty nearly accurate. I mean, the, the individual estimates would be somewhat variable. And so over a period of years, they started getting rid of the need for all of the sort of the rigmarole of everybody filling in little forms and so on and so forth. Um, and they were looking more at other aspects. I want you to find that article, it's quite fun. 
But at the end of it, unfortunately, the bull died because everybody was so much worried about other things, they forgot to feed the bull. And there was a, a parable about the um, stock market, actually, the sort of 2008, 9, 10 sort of times. But it's very, very interesting about how we, if we're not careful, um, in terms of our information governance, even corporate governance level, we may start looking at the wrong parameters in the way that things are working. I want to draw out of that um, one rather interesting one. Kay talks about the principle of enlightened shareholder value and talks a little bit about in that up the final uh, report that was produced in 2012, a little bit about uh, how it impacts upon directors and senior executives. And to help you, I've actually got a slide, I'll put a, little, a couple of slides up below this in Blackboard, which are the extract of the three parts of section 172 of the UK Shareholder uh, Companies to, uh, Act 20, uh, 2006, which is the one I've mentioned before about the, um, the fact that shareholders aren't even mentioned in many respects in that list. But the other thing that's important as you look at the purpose of a business, a corporation, a registered corporation, what, call it what you like, is to think about what it's actually there for. Is it there to sell things, services and products? Is it there to make a profit? Is it there to provide employment? Is it there for social purposes? What is it there for? And you need to have a look at the responsibilities in section 172 to, to get some sort of feel for it. And it's also important when you think about um, the longer term life, the sustainability of organizations. If you think about you know, companies like Rolls Royce Aerospace or Pratt & Whitney or General Electric in the aerospace jet engine business, are they there to make jet engines? Is that <coughs> a fundamental uh, purpose in life? To answer that, you then got to look at, well, who are their customers? And you know, oh, it's airlines, like British Airways or United Airlines, American Airlines, uh, Lufthansa, etc. What is their business? Is it actually to fly aircraft, to operate, own, operate and fly aircraft, or is it something else? What do you think about the, 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 the way that the directors and owners, shareholders of, of airlines think about things, what, what's the, what they think their primary purpose is? <coughs> To be an airline, yeah. Do you think it's to, so? If you think about Emirates or some of the we can ask the main objective they have the question on top of it. They need to provide a service to. I mean, they are not uh, responsible for transportation. It's just the trip to provide the excellent trip. Uh, yeah. How can they provide leisure and stuff for the? Okay, so you're beginning to get away from owning and operating aircraft, yeah. You may so make a profit, yeah. Um, in, a, in a sense, if you step back from the airline, a bit like you, Justin, so your name is? Yeah, I'm Mohammed. Hamid, Hamid. Um, Hamid or Mohammed? Mohammed. Mohammed. Um, you're getting, I think, to what sort of area I'm thinking of, which is, they're, in a sense, they're primary purpose, yes, make money, um, but is to move p people, customers, from place A to place B. Yeah. The fact that today's technology is either cylindrical, cylinders of um, aluminium or cylinders of glass fibre with some things that stick out sideways with some extraordinarily expensive heaps of metal underneath them called engines, is kind of something that they really would prefer not to be involved in most of the time because, hey, it's all horribly expensive, clutters up your balance sheet badly, um, is technically a problem because they're mostly highly reliable but sometimes occasionally not. And if they could find some other way of moving passengers around the world, customers around the world, I'm sure they would love it. And that's why the aerospace industry has actually moved away of late from the airlines owning the aircraft and owning the engines to paying sort of effectively 
a service fee for every hour of flight. And the manufacturers, particularly for the engines, um, maintain the responsibility or given the responsibility for looking after those engines for the engine's life of typically 30 odd years. Um, and that's really how co companies are beginning to question their purpose in very, very fundamental ways. That they are more and more providing services rather than solid lumps of product like a jet engine or a machine tool. Uh, the company is now thinking that, that GKN really doesn't actually want to own lots and lots of machine tools to make their widgets. They look on themselves as a widget manufacturer providing a service to aerospace. And if the widget, ma if the machine tool manufacturer can just install the right equipment to make widgets of whatever sort on the shop floor and then look after it, monitor it over the internet and so on, and when it fails, um, come and fix it, maybe predictively predict a failure from sort of changes in the measurements and come in and fix something before it fails, and then you just pay you know, the machine manufacturer you know, a small royalty or whatever per widget sold. Completely different way of looking at your business. I am making machine tools or I am making jet engines to, I'm providing a service that I charge my customer um, some sort of usage fee. And it has all sorts of interesting effects on the finances of companies as well. But yeah, profitability is important. Cash flow is, import is even more important. No company has ever gone bust if it has a positive cash flow. Because the profit and loss is actually an interesting negotiation between three parties. The company, its shareholders, and the taxman. As a way of sharing out what the company is, uh, the, the money that the company is making. And uh, we see regularly, every time a chief executive or chairman of a big company changes, they do what's called kitchen sinking. They roll up all sorts of things that might need fixing into a big provision which is set against tax. And so most companies make gigantic um, tax losses the year that the chief exec or the chairman changes. And then it kind of flows back out later on. But talking about, you are saying, about uh, Luke, about um, airlines making profits. If you look back over the last 50, 60 years, airlines turn out to be a stunningly good way of losing money. Because the capital costs are so high, <coughs> Malaysian Airlines in a more recent example. All sorts of airlines being a very good example. <laughs> American is a fairly good example. Shareways, Iberia, uh, they're all good examples of just how unprofitable airline, the airline business actually is. Um, even uh, Donald Trump at one stage, stage, I think owned TWA, sort of saying, this is not some, something you do if you want to make money <laughs> long term. So, Lots of interesting thoughts, and I'll just show you um, the Companies Act, because it's actually kind of interesting. The duty of a director is to promote the success of the company. You know, the word is members as a whole is kind of interesting. Some people might interpret that as the shareholders and the bondholders, but look at this sequence. Long-term consequences. And if you look at most, certainly Anglo-Saxon Western companies, they are worrying about the short term. What do our decisions do for the value of our shares tomorrow, and in three month, three days' time, three weeks' time, three months' time. Whereas, if you go back, it's not that long ago in Japan, I think it's still the truth, it's true today, they actually don't care, the directors of Japanese companies, what is happening in the stock markets. <coughs> because their outlook is 100 years. The success of the company, the stability of the company, 100 years from now, for my children's children's children, now, there's no UK or American USA company that 
takes that perspective if they're in the main the trade on the main stock exchanges. So long termism is encouraged in law. Second point, kind of even more interesting, the company's employees. Living wage springs to mind. What also springs to mind here is that the last 40 odd years, I think it is, yeah, 40, 50 years, almost all of the benefits of productivity have gone to the shareholders and the corporate executives. Very little productivity improvement um, benefit has turned up in directly in salaries if adjusted for cost of living. By and large, most direct most companies driven by the shareholders of all sizes failed to think about those at all. If we think about the problems with the implementation of IT, such as you looked at in IT service management, that the problems of failure and the staggering extra costs associated with challenge and failed projects. And even with successful projects, there have been a quite bizarre um, loading of tasks onto employees um, as a result of the development and implementation of IT in very, very curious and very un unpleasant ways in many respects. The ability with IT to drive um, employees to work at a fixed speed that's faster than is really comfortable because we can do it. We can improve productivity by getting st our staff to do more and more things quicker and quicker. <coughs> we can get, we reduce the amount of functionality we provide in our systems in spite of the fact that customers want it, need that task. Luke. What's the source of this one? Was it on the previous page? Yeah, it's the Companies Act, UK Companies Act 2006. And so if you just put UK Companies Act 2006, section 172, it will lead you straight to here. The third one is interesting. Fostering the business relationships, in other words, kind of a win-win approach to life with suppliers, customers, and others, other stakeholders. Fourthly, to consider the impact of the company's operations on the community and the environment, which draws into mind, um, do not fiddle the environmental pollution criteria on your software. Thinking about a very recent event. And then balancing out everything between all of the members, including the shareholders. That's quite, I find that a really rather interesting sequence. <coughs> and I find it very interesting as a reminder that, that the directors are not there just to preserve or safeguard <coughs> the shareholders' assets, nor to make as big a profit as possible. It also, if you think about that community, that also, of course, includes the government and perhaps should lead one to consider paying them a reasonable amount of tax in the right jurisdictions. Thinking about other fairly common uh, debates going on at the moment. So we can use this to really calibrate what a good company, a good group of directors is doing. And so, you know, the need to act fairly between members of the company, so employees, the community, and the, um, the government, and shareholders and so on, <coughs> underpaying the employees, so they need to have tax credits from us, the community and taxpayers, so that they can make a profit to pay the shareholders. It's kind of not how I read that one. <coughs> and then there are a couple of caveats in the sections two and three, um, which, yeah, they kind of are interesting, but they're not as important to me 
That is section one. So, oops, okay, one. So that really is sort of some of what I want you to think about for um, a little bit of research. Think about those ideas about the, what companies are for. Go look at those um, papers by John Kay. I know these are right outside your normal um, sphere, your normal sort of comfort zone, but they give you a different perspective that will help you to answer the assignment. Okay, folks, well, I want you to go find those <coughs> and see what you make of them.